So I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and biodiversity. And uh, I suppose as Margot alluded to, I, I'm not quite sure today what hat I'm speaking with. So it's best to assume I don't speak with any hat. So uh, my day job is with Natural England, the Government Conservation Agency for England, where I lead out work on climate change, particularly from the standpoint of turning science into practical application. Um, but yes, I'm also a, a reader in the Church of England, and um, I have a visiting position at Oxford University. I suggest that today, though, you just uh, take, assume that anything I say is my own thoughts and uh, blame me entirely. <coughs> Although I've benefited from many colleagues over many years. <laughs> I want to start by giving a little bit of background on climate change itself, um, right at the start of this day on climate change. That seemed to make sense. Then I'll go on to impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems. And then just in the last few minutes, we want to think about what can we do, both individually and as a society, about some of the issues I've been discussing. And finally, you'll know we're in the home straight once we get on to the, the does it matter bit at the end. So climate change, then, a little bit of background. And I think it's worth starting really at the most basic level, a picture of a, a greenhouse at Kew Gardens. And the term greenhouse effect has become something that people like me just take for granted these days. But it's worth saying, the basic physics of climate change have been known for many years, many decades, centuries almost. And it's quite simple. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the basic principle of the greenhouse effect, which is that heat radiation coming in from the sun, is trapped within the Earth's atmosphere in the same way that glass traps heat within a greenhouse because of the gases within the atmosphere, things like carbon dioxide. That basic principle is quite, <coughs> simple, quite well established. There's nothing dreadfully controversial about it any more than stepping into a greenhouse on a sunny day and experiencing that nice warmth um, is just accepted. Basic physics very simple, very well known, very accepted. <coughs> we also have extremely strong evidence of how some of those gases, those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are changing. <coughs> Most notably carbon dioxide coming from a range of different sources, from fossil fuel burning in power stations and cars, airplanes, burning of forests, It's also pretty well established that there are many other sources of greenhouse gases, other greenhouse gases, things like methane. And uh, my picture of cows there reminds me to say that. Or nitrous oxides from agriculture, from loss from agricultural soils. And this is a, an iconic graph showing the rise in carbon dioxide concentrations since the late 1950s at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. A wonderfully far-sighted person, Charles Keeling, started that work back in the 1950s. And it's, it's I wish that all my results looked like that. <laughs> it's a beautiful graph, elegant, clear. And it, it's increasing. There is really no realistic doubt about that. Things start to get more complicated once you start to model what effect those changes in greenhouse gases might have on the atmosphere and on the Earth's climate. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm someone who's worked with climate scientists for um, even longer than I've known Margot, I think, actually. <laughs> but I'm not one myself. Uh, it's, a, it's a specialist task. But fortunately, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been going now for even not quite as long as I've known Mark. No, about that, about that, yeah. Um, and that's really done a lot to bring together the world's view of the science, climate of science, the science of climate change, and the most recent reports that have come out within the last year or so. I'm not going to summarise them in any detail. If you've ever looked at them, they're enormous. They are authoritative. 
But this is a striking picture. This shows the trend in um, the temperature of the Earth's surface over the last century or so. Basically, everywhere where it's red, it's got warmer. Everywhere it's blue, it's got a bit colder. Everywhere it's white, we're not too sure. So there are significant gaps in our recording. But you don't have to be a climate scientist to really understand, looking at that, that most of the world has warmed. And it's warmed by about a degree on average. And again, this is something we do know with some degree of confidence, both from records taken at the Earth's surface in traditional meteorological stations, which have been going for all that time, and also more recently from satellite. We have other indicators that the world is changing in ways that are consistent with a warming world. The amount of sea ice in the Arctic has been declining in recent years. This is particularly summer sea ice. There's a natural cycle, of course, with um, melting in summer, freezing over again in winter. But the summer sea ice has declined. Very hard to give any other explanation than the fact that the world is warm. And the level of sea, sea level has risen. <coughs> Again, very good long-term monitoring records showing that the sea level has risen um, over the last century. Risen partly because of melting of sea ice, but also because of the expansion of water in the warm world. So we know that change is already happening. The science base is strong. If we step, take a step into the future with the climate scientists, complex climate models encapsulating all we know about the Earth system tell us that warming is almost inevitably going to continue into the future. How much it changes will depend on how much we go on limiting greenhouse gases, the sensitivity of the Earth's, of the Earth's systems, and what time scale we're looking at. But even if we were able to turn off all sources of emissions today, and we're not going to do that, the world would still continue to warm, just because of the inertia that's already there in the climate system, the warming that's already built in. If we carry on on the track of emissions that we're currently on, I suppose the, the best judgment is that you're heading on that sort of red line up there. That's the kind of trajectory we're on at the moment, which is getting up to perhaps four degrees of warming, possibly more even, over the course of the coming century. And I think it's worth pointing out with uncertainty. People always say, well, it's uncertain, isn't it? Well, yes, it is, but uncertainty cuts both ways. Yes, it might be that at the moment, but it might be worse. So there's plenty of cause for worry. I'm zooming in now from the big picture, big world picture of climate, onto the UK, and I'm going to take a step beyond that onto biodiversity, which is where I really have some expertise, I hope. What might this mean for the UK? Well, our best understanding is that temperature increases are likely to continue and probably to accelerate. We've already seen warming within the UK, a degree or so. That's likely to continue. That's one of the clearer things to understand. The bigger issue in terms of uh, challenges in predictions or projections for the future is really about rainfall. We have started to see evidence coming out of the Met Office in the last couple of years or so that we already have more rain tending to fall in heavier storm events. Now this is a very much harder thing to tie down precisely to climate change, but it's been interesting as somebody who watches the uh, pronouncements coming out of my climatologist colleagues to see how the, uh, the confidence in that has just started to ratchet up over the last few years. And certainly in a warmer world, a more dynamic hydrological system, it's quite, uh, it's quite reasonable to expect that there might be more storm events. <coughs> the climate models for the UK also consistently have shown for a number of years that on average, 
we're in a situation moving towards drier summers and wetter winters. Some uncertainty around that, but that's a fairly consistent pattern that comes out of the climate models. And also the ongoing rise in sea level um, we can expect in the UK. As with the global situation though, how much depends on how long into the future we're looking. The global emissions of um, greenhouse gases and climate sensitivity. I, I often tell colleagues in trying to plan for climate change, which is a large part of my job, don't get too hung up on the specific projections. Look at the direction of travel. Look at those patterns that come out in the model projections. That's often the level that we have to work at. But there is a clear signal coming out. Okay, so that's that sort of background really. Let's move on then. Because I think in many ways the challenge around climate change is not whether it's happening or not, it's regard what certain newspapers might lead you to believe. But actually, the real challenge is not whether the world is changing. Even most climate skeptics will acknowledge that there is some change in play. The big question is, what's the impact of that, and does that matter? Is it important enough to do something about it? So let's look at some of the impacts. And I'm going to look at ecosystems and biodiversity, because I know something about that. I'm also going to say most about the UK, I should say. But let's again take the big global overview. Two maps. You don't need to look at the detail, but the biology of the Earth, the ecology of the Earth, is determined by climate. And we can see that at this global scale. And it's very telling that if you look at the boundaries between these big ecological areas, these biomes, as they're sometimes termed, if you look at the boundaries of these biomes, you can start to see change occur. These are the places on the edge of the climatic tolerance of, of ecosystems. And this is a, a map that comes from the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report on the impacts of climate change. And you can see the, the numbers that are highlighted there. And this is showing where there is evidence of shifts or changes at the interface between the big vegetation boundaries, uh, big, big global categories of vegetation. Just to give it some um, emphasis, this is a piece of research that was done in the, um, in the Arctic, the Canadian Arctic at Herschel Island. And um, you're probably too far away to see in detail, but if you were to look close, come here and look closely, don't do that, but if you were to, <laughs> you can see where those white lines draw around patches. Those are patches of, of willow, willow, very small scale willow trust. And uh, 1987 on the left, 2009 on the right. And those patches of willow are growing and expanding and new ones are developing. It's a really sort of um, nice example, I think, of, of the spread of a biome going northwards. So something's up. We can see it at the boundaries, but actually, again, if you take the big global overview, each of these little symbols indicates a climate change impact that's been starting to emerge against the government panel on climate change. And all across the world, there are indicators of change in the biodiversity of the Earth. Now, we're not going to look at the whole of the Earth. Um, I should be in trouble if I go on that one. But we are going to look at <coughs> into the UK at some detail. And um, one of my big projects over the last couple of years has been to produce a summary of the impacts of climate change in the UK, <coughs> working with a range of partners in universities and research institutes. So we produced the Terrestrial Biodiversity Climate Change Impacts Report Card. So a report card is a small booklet, really, with, with headline messages. But it's underpinned by a series of very detailed reviews of uh, running to several hundred pages in total. So this is the accessible front end to it. And it provides, I think, a nice 
summary of what's actually happening in the UK and how that might change into the future. Um, if you're interested, you can uh, view it online at that address. I'm sure we can make that available. We came up with a series of headline messages. And our headline of the headlines, as it were, was this. That there's strong evidence that climate change is already affecting the UK's biodiversity and that we expect the magnitude of those impacts to increase going into the future. And we'll run through very quickly the different elements of those impacts. So one of the most clear changes that we're beginning to see is species moving further north or to higher altitudes. And in the UK, that's strongly suggestive of species relocating to cooler environments. This is just one example of a cricket, the long-winged conehead. If you look at the distribution map for it on the right, the greens and yellows are essentially where it used to occur. We're talking 60s, 70s. Whereas the blue is where it occurs now, where it's spread to over the, the few decades since then. And it's, it's a really quite clear grab of land by this little cricket. And that's a very common pattern. This isn't an unusual example. Of the animal species that have been looked at, more have shifted than haven't. And some have gone an awful long way. Good news for some things, bad news for others. The mountain ringlet, by contrast, is a butterfly that's typical of the upland areas of Britain, the cold areas. You only really get it in the Scottish Highlands and just with the toehold in the Lake District. And survey work showed how that species was tending to be lost. Colonies of that butterfly at the lower part of its altitude or range um, have been disappearing. And on balance, the authors of this study concluded that this species had moved 130 to 150 millimetres. Millimetres. 150 metres. <laughs> <laughs> 130 to 150 metres uphill um, tracking cooler conditions. <clears throat> the other really clear example that people like me like to draw upon is the fact that we've seen changes in the timing of events, of spring events, so what's known as phenology, the timing of biological events has shifted forwards. So warmer springs in recent decades have caused trends towards many biological events, things like egg laying in, in birds and um, vertebrates, things like buds breaking and flowers coming up that tend to occur earlier. And there's really a huge amount of data on this. It's, it's some, there's a sort of subtext to this presentation is about how um, the British are great natural historians who love recording what they see in the natural world around them, be that where they've spotted a new butterfly species or the date at which you know, the oak tree comes into control. So we know from a very thorough study of 725 species or groups of species that nearly 84% of the events recorded have become earlier. And that the mean change, and this is in the last few decades, going back to um, between about the 1970s and um, well, the period leading up to 2010. On average, events have moved forward by roughly 12 days. So almost spring has been, on average, almost two weeks earlier, if you like. Now that, of course, doesn't mean that every spring has been two weeks earlier. I'm sure, like me, you can remember some are cold years as well. But those are interesting too, because we can see that there's a strong relationship between whether it's an early spring or a late spring and when biological events happen. So we know there is a good relationship. It's not just advancing for some other reason, like the, I don't know, we're growing different varieties of daffodils. We know there's a link between climate and timing, and we know it's on average getting earlier. Now one of my sort of things I want to instinctively say is, well, so what, you know, as long as the plants and the birds are there, the fact that they're doing things earlier is perhaps not too important. But when you start to think that they all interact with each other, 
and the flowers are pollinated in many cases by, um, by insects. That birds depend on eating caterpillars, for example, to feed their young. Then the fact that this change is happening, and also that it isn't affecting all species uniformly, some of them advance more than others, you've got the potential for a disturbance in a finely balanced system. So it's not just of um, anecdotal interest. We can say a little bit about rainfall and precipitation. Um, I can say precipitation because obviously sometimes it's snow. But um, the effects of climate change on our rainfall patterns, as I've already mentioned, are much less clear than they are for temperature. But there is reasonable grounds for uh, concern that it would its precipitation phase would be disturbed. If and when that happens, we would expect potentially very large effects on organisms. In many ways, in a country like Britain, it's the effects of an occasional drought that we would have to worry about, perhaps more than a degree or so of warming. We'll come back to that in a minute. But we can see evidence that different species <coughs> respond differently to the amount of water supply <coughs> that they're getting. We know that some habitats are more vulnerable than others. We can see evidence for this. And we picked out, as a group of scientists working together, three where there were particular causes of concern. Montane habitats, so those types of vegetation on the very tops of our mountains. If everything's moving northwards and to higher altitude, there are some things that have nowhere to go. Secondly, for wetlands, and this relates to the possibility of changes in rainfall patterns and potentially drier summers. Also, certainly with rising temperatures, more evaporation, more evapotranspiration. So the risk of wetlands drying out represents a threat to their continuation in some places. And finally, coastal habitats. And um, I will say a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. But as the sea level rises, and in some cases storm events become more severe, the pure physical erosion of the coast is an issue that we, we have to contend with. Left to its own devices, our coast would naturally erode and habitats move backwards. But often we put concrete flood defences in place to stop that happening. So potentially you have an erosion of coastal habitats. Um, well, not potentially, you are. We're seeing that um, going right up to those flood defences. <coughs> Just a, an example of a plant that, especially a plant I did my PhD on, so I'm rather fond of it. Alpine <laughs> Alpina, Alpine Ladies Mountain. Quite common on the tops of Scottish mountains. Another of those things with just a toehold in the Lake District in England. That's where it currently occurs on Ben Laws, the National Nature Reserve in Scotland. That's the red bits. You kind of see the relief map picking out the hills. That's at the moment. Um, PhD student of mine did some modelling work. And uh, in the 2080s, that shows where, oh dear, no red marks. The climate space, the conditions with, in which this species currently occurs would disappear, essentially. Um, now, it may hang on. There might be some um, you know, cool north-facing slopes, some little pockets, perhaps, where it's protected from competition from other species. But it's a pretty bleak prospect. Thinking a little bit more about changes in distribution where species occur. Climate change increases the chances that non-native species, and that includes some pests and pathogens, disease-causing organisms, may establish and spread. It probably doesn't affect the chances of them landing here in the first place. They're often brought here by, by people's activities, and sometimes just on the wind. So something like ash decline, um, you know, the threat to our ash trees, probably largely came from imported ash saplings. But what it might change is what can establish and spread once it gets here. Now that's not all bad news. So the species on the, the left there, the small red-eyed damselfly, that's something that's colonised Britain and spread throughout the country, south to north, um, in the last few decades. 
as far as I'm aware, it doesn't cause any trouble to anything else, and we can simply see that as an enhancement of our biodiversity. And for many of these species that may establish in the UK, having previously had a continental European distribution, we should probably welcome them, but at the <coughs> south end of their range, they may be in southern Europe, they may well get squeezed and, and be moving out. So that's not bad news. One on the left, the, sorry, one on the right, the procession of moth is a different story. This is a, a pest of oak trees. It also has health implications for people because it's a respiratory disease, strangely enough. And that's another species that has established itself in the last few years. But we know here it's on the northern edge of its range. So warming temperatures are very likely to increase the chances of its colonising further north. And there's an active campaign uh, last, <coughs> been an active campaign over the last two summers to try and eradicate that, and we'll, we'll see what comes up this year. Climate change, of course, isn't the only pressure on our natural environment. And in many ways, if we just had a warming climate, the, the inbuilt resilience of ecosystems would put a place to respond and to adjust natural as in the way that they have to pass climate changes. Partly different in the speed at which climate is warming at the moment, but also, very importantly, climate change will interact with all of the other pressures that biodiversity faces in the UK, for example, land use changes and pollution. You see a little bit of uh, landscape there, and it, it, it's there to show you what a fragmented landscape we have. Little patches of semi-natural habitat um, isolated by agricultural fields or development. And that makes it very difficult, for example, for species to spread naturally. It also means we have very small populations of many species, which are more vulnerable to something like an extreme event, like a drought. So that you've got a ratcheting up of the pressure on our environment from multiple factors. Those little bits of protected land, though, those conservation sites, um, my colleagues and I are very anxious to give a message that they remain important. So the protected area network, sites of special scientific interest. We've got good evidence now that they are some of the places which species often colonise first in spreading to new areas, and also some of the places they hang on best. So one of the challenges that sometimes comes back to us as conservationists in the context of climate change is that, well, all the sites that you're already protecting, surely they're not going to be any use anymore. All the species that they were protected for in the first place will have moved out long ago. Possibly they will move, but that's not to say others won't come in. So, um, well, we can always think a little bit about how we adapt to climate change in a moment, I'll come back to that point. But, but we already have scientific evidence that species are particularly favouring protected areas, even in the context of climate change. A bit more about extreme events. Droughts, floods and fires. <coughs> Those sort of events can change the course of an ecosystem. We can, already, we can still see the traces of the 1976 summer drought on some woodlands, for example, Lady Park Wood on the border between England and Wales and the Wye Valley. There's still a signal of the death of, of beech trees in that wood at that time that persists to this day. Floods, something that's concerned us over the last few years, actually there seems to be a lot more innate ability of systems to respond and recover from a flood. But locally, there could be concerns about that. And certainly from something like a, a fire event, which if we're not careful, could be favoured by hot, dry summers, um, can be quite a serious concern. So there might be a change in the extremes, the, the, the big weather event, rather than a gradual change in the mean, that is what causes the most harm in the long term, if we're not careful. And finally, for our impact, and I haven't dwelt on this and I'm not going to, but we do expect to see indirect effects of climate change on biodiversity 
So for example, the way farmers farm, in a warmer climate, different crops start to become attractive and viable. The way we manage water will become more important, for good or bad, if we continue to abstract large amounts of water from catchments for, for human needs, then inevitably it's, it's the wetland nature reserve, the fen, the marsh that pays the price for that. On the other hand, if we get better at storing water, for example building small reservoirs on farms, maybe that pressure would ease. Changing international markets. Imagine if the, you've only got to go into um, your supermarket and look to see how much we depend on southern Europe for much of our, many of our vegetables. If productivity in the Mediterranean declines, how will that affect international markets? How will our, how will our agriculture respond? Hard to predict, but you can bet there will be an impact. And that will take its toll on our land. And then there's our direct responses to climate change in terms of mitigation, changes in energy sources, and the way we adapt. And let's say about that in a moment. So what do we do? Margot already in her introduction mentioned the term adaptation. Adapting to climate change. Coping with the consequences of climate change, and in some cases, taking advantage of opportunities. It would be an opportunity for some farmers to grow different crops. I've already mentioned that. It's not really negative, although there is significant risk. And quite a large part of my work these days is about that process of adaptation, both uh, nationally, the, um, the government's official sort of statement on it, the National Adaptation Programme, something that's required under the Climate Change Act, uh, I was involved in drafting the chapter on the natural environment in that. But also at a more detailed level, we recently published uh, as Natural England and the RSPB, with some support from the Environment Agency and the Forestry Commission, an adaptation manual that brings together all of our resources and understanding about how we can adapt to climate change. Some of the elements for that, some of it is in terms of building resilience, which I sometimes um, holding on to what we've got as best we can. <clears throat> and we're getting increasingly good evidence that if we have relatively large blocks of habitat um, in good condition, then we can reduce those risks. So this is a uh, House National Nature Reserve in the Northern Pennines, a large expanse of um, blanket bog, heathland, and grassland, and it's quite a resilient system. But we also have to come to terms with the fact that we will have to accept some change and adjust to it as best we can. And um, this is somewhere I was uh, about a month ago in the North North Coast at Salt House. And um, this, uh, well, you can see it's, it's a closed car park. If you were to uh, shovel out all of the shingle there, you'd find the car park underneath it. But um, during last winter storms, 2013-2014, the shingle bar on the coast of Salt House moved in land. It was, well, the shingle was physically moved in by the force of the storm. And this is an area of coast that's retreating, and retreating fairly rapidly. How do we adjust to that? We could put a concrete wall there. If we do that, we will lose the habitats. But also, it gets very difficult to go on maintaining <laughs> and being able to afford all those concrete hard flood defences. And actually, a nice area of, of shingle can absorb some of that force and protect the land that lies behind it. So the way we manage the coast at the moment is about accepting change, but managing change so we can balance up the needs of, uh, of people, the people who live behind it, of agriculture and the habitats. It's a very difficult thing to do in practice. If yours is the house that's going to fall into the sea, you tend to err on the side of concrete flood defence. <laughs> As a nation, leaving aside any environmental concerns, 
concerns, to protect every house on a cliff edge would cost us an absolute fortune, and it isn't a sustainable process in the long term. Interestingly, if you, I'm digressing slightly, if you talk to Dutch people, um, it's sometimes been summed up to me, the national adaptation strategy for, for the Netherlands is, is simple, build bigger ducks. But when you think about it, the whole country, or not the whole country, but a large element of the country was reclaimed from the sea. And, you know, it's a real existential threat to the Netherlands. Um, we have a more, uh, we have a different history of our relationship with the sea, I think, and, you know, that wouldn't be a strategy for, for us. But anyway, it's a real pinch point for the coast. Sometimes we see the natural environment as sort of a, I don't know, a sort of burden to be carried almost by human society. And I, I feel very strongly that's the wrong way of looking at it. Actually, the natural environment is what supports us. It gives us the place we live, it gives us our food, and it gives us pleasure and enjoyment. But in the context of dealing with climate change, actually the way we manage the land offers opportunities, I think if you like, the win-win situation for nature and for people. And um, this is a photograph that was um, published in The Guardian last winter. And um, the man in the front here, um, Nigel Hester, works for the National Trust. He's the, uh, on the Honnecker estate that they own um, in Somerset. Now, most of the publicity about Somerset last winter was around flooding in the Somerset levels. Homnica is not that far away, and it's an area which has had flooding problems in the past. But some years ago, the National Trust embarked on a very ambitious scheme to <coughs> reduce flood risk, but to do it in a way that worked with natural processes rather than um, through hard concrete defences. So they're looking out over an area of grassland that's been deliberately allowed to flood by building up bunts. Um, <coughs> sort of a, a bank, to slow the flow of water, to hold it in places where flood water is not going to cause damage to people and their homes. Um, and also things like allowing woody debris to fall into streams, which again can slow the flow of water rushing down through the stream. People often talk about dredging watercourses and taking debris out. Of course, if you want something to drain out quickly, that makes eminent sense. If you're on the receiving end of the floods coming down, though, uh, it makes much more sense to slow up the water and stop it flowing quite so fast. <coughs> so uh, it gets a chance to dissipate, to go into the ground, and to remove the, the very sort of spike in the water. Now, I, I can't pretend that it's easy managing a catchment like that, but there is an opportunity. <coughs> to think about the effects of, of an extreme weather event, to think about where will it not do harm, for example, to store flood water. And maybe it can do some good as well, to actually create a wetland in those places. And, and it's, it's quite exciting that this has been talked about for a number of years. It's actually starting to be tried and found to work, at least in some situations, which I, I think is a really hopeful sign. Adaptation then, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And we can't prevent, or we can't cope with all of the challenges that climate change will present to the natural environment without considerable amount of loss. Species that can't move fast enough, habitats that are not sustainable. Britain would look very different under a very extreme climate scenario. So, how do we reduce emissions and mitigate climate change? Mitigation in this con in the climate change context usually means about reducing the amount of climate change. And um, you know probably about energy efficiency, renewable energy, nuclear energy. But there are other things as well in the mix, things like more efficient use of fertilizer in agriculture. Again, it's one of those win-win situations where you use just the amount you need to reduce your costs and reduce emissions. 
And there's some big ticket items globally around uh, reducing deforestation or positively afforesting areas. And within the UK, the way we look at managed our land, probably protecting and restoring wetlands is one of our best opportunities. Um, that's a not very exciting slide, but it is to me. Um, <laughs> if you look very carefully, you might have to trust me on this, but there, there's a little uh, bump there. It doesn't look much, but it's where somebody has blocked a drainage ditch in a blanket bog. We had a vote for draining our blanket bogs to try and make them more productive. It wasn't overly successful, um, but it also caused the blanket bog to dry, dry out, changing its biodiversity, and reducing it, making it more prone to fire, and also losing carbon. So we've had a massive push to block these drainage ditches, or grips as they're called, um, across the British uplands. And this is an example of a big little pool there with sphagnum colonising it. And restoring the health of our peatlands is a, it's a small contribution globally, but it's, it's something we can do within our power. And actually, any one of the elements of climate change mitigation is small. It's what they add up to, and we have to play out in our lives. And it's a good example. <coughs> Particularly good because it, it's good for biodiversity as well as for climate change. Right, if you recall my opening comments, you'll see we're into the, uh, into the finishing straight. <coughs> Does it matter? Because actually I think that's the big question. It's not convincing a sceptical world that science is rigorous. Science has been well proven to be rigorous, but it's the judgment about does this matter? Is it a priority? Is it a priority for me? Is it a priority for society? <coughs> and I think, you, you know, as a group of uh, coming together within a Christian context, we should think about the moral and ethical considerations. Let's not be afraid to say there is some self interest in this. We benefit from the world we live in. Climate change is a threat to us. Then, of course, there's the responsibility to our children and our grandchildren. How we hand on something to the next generation. And one of the issues with climate change is thinking, what do we have to do now? Not necessarily because it's a big priority now, because there's a big threat now, but if we don't act now, it will be too late in the future. It's an enormously difficult thing for policy and politics to grapple with. And politicians, my masters in my career, um, my professional life, they respond to us as an electorate, don't they? If, if we're not asking people to take that long-term view, they won't. It's very easy to blame the politicians, but who do they answer to? They answer to us. There's also the need to protect the vulnerable, things like coastal erosion. We have a problem here, we have vulnerable people in this country who are at risk of flooding. And it is often the more vulnerable, the poorer communities who are more at risk from, for example, flooding or from heat waves. Globally, that's even more true. I, I had the uh, great privilege of being in Brazil um, a week, week and a half ago. And hearing about some of their challenges, the city of Sao Paulo, nearly 20 million people, a mega city, came to the point where it had less than 10% of its reservoir capacity full at the end of the drought last summer. I walked around Sao Paulo, and you can see people sleeping on the streets. There are many wealthy people in Brazil, but there's also an awful lot of very vulnerable people people in poor housing and so on, people in Rio near the coast as the sea level rises. So to protect the vulnerable who have much more limited capacity to adapt, we should be concerned about this as Christians. And then particularly within my area, there's not time to develop it now, but I don't think in this audience I, I need to defend stewardship of nature as part of our Christian duty. So I, I believe deeply for many years. But when we see a threat 
of change in our natural environment where <coughs> we don't even know what we're doing, to be honest, about how some of these different threats interact with each other in the longer term. We're playing with a system that we have any partial knowledge of. And we need to take responsibility for our actions. It seems to me we do sometimes live in a society where people don't want to take responsibility for our actions. We're more concerned about our freedom to do what we like than taking responsibility for it. And as a church, we ought to take a stand against that. But finally, I don't want to end on a gloomy note. I think this is also about living well. And I think there is an individual element to this challenge.